Hello, everybody. Welcome back once again to the YouTube channel. This evening, I am joined by Dr. Viru Kassivisvanathan, academic urologist and researcher at University College London and University College London Hospital. Viru, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you for having me, Ollie. It's a pleasure to be on. I've seen some of your previous podcasts and very happy to join and um, hopefully provide some information that's useful to your audience. I'm sure, I'm sure. And I'm I'm very wary with <laughs> with someone in the position that you're in that there's almost there's almost too much we could talk about. So I've got lots of questions from uh, the the viewers and and regular followers that they've submitted, um, as well as some things that I want to chat to you about personally. But today we're going to be talking all about urology, and urology is a specialty, and your journey to getting to where you are now and the very esteemed position that you're in. So. Perhaps could we start just by by talking about what urology actually is and maybe what it isn't as well? So uh, urology is typically classified as a surgical specialty. Um, so it involves organs such as the kidney, uh, the bladder, the tubes in between and the external genitalia. And um, the pathology can be cancer related or it can be non-cancer related. Um, most of the work we do involves um, seeing patients in clinic, um, starting medications for them, deciding when they need to have something more like an operation and doing those operations. Um, there are a range of diagnostic procedures which we can do as well. And we have a whole host of uh, really nice cool gadgets to use to do some of these procedures as well. So very much a mixture of medical and surgical management, I suppose. Yeah, it's probably a bit more medical than some of the surgical specialties, which I quite like, um, but it's probably on the balance of things, more of a surgical than a medical specialty. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, I, bef I suppose then before we, before we rush too, too much further in, would you mind just taking us through your medical education journey and then how you how you came to be in the role that you're currently in yeah so i um studied at imperial um i did a six-year undergraduate course and after that um i realized during my medical school years i was quite interested in surgery i had a really good role model in surgery and i was inspired to go the full way um, uh, after applying for um foundation program training which was in uh, an academic surgery job um, I said, yeah, this is definitely what I want to do. Um, I thought about the specialty in which I could go in. And uh, I was originally quite interested in vascular surgery because the pathology, I really loved the pathology and how it related to how you manage your patients. And I did some placements in that in my F1 year and F2 year. That's your first two years after qualifying. Um, a lot of the patients didn't do so well. And I found that that was something that I didn't necessarily find as um, satisfying as I thought I would. Um, and I then did a urology placement, um, which I absolutely loved. And um, it was so many aspects about the urology um, field, which interested me from the people you work with who are all amazing and just friendly people to the patient group who are generally quite a nice patient group um, to interact with. And um, it's, it's really fun. I've, I enjoy working with that group and uh, the pathology. Uh, which is really quite fascinating pathology, and particularly the academia, which really changes practice and the way you do things on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, I applied for an academic clinical fellowship in neurology uh, and got that. And then um, that was affiliated with UCL. And that was uh, my research base started as an ST1 and where it still is now. Um, I then completed my core surgical training, which was two years in London, um, I did one year in North London and one year in South London and then um, started my uh, registrar training. And um, because it was uh, an ACF job at the end of your three year of your ACF post, which finishes at the end of your ST3, um, there's the opportunity to come out and do a PhD. And so I came out of training full time to do a PhD in uh, prostate cancer and the role of MR and, and the diagnosis of prostate cancer and really found an area that I enjoyed and um, really found that that was my calling. And so decided to 
um, complete my PhD, go back into training, um, apply to get an academic clinical lecture job, which is a 50-50 job split between clinical work and research, and completed my training um, and finished off at University College London, um, where uh, I was a um, fully qualified uh, urological surgeon. And that's kind of in the UK where my journey uh, ended. And that brings us up to the present day where just for, for the sake of those watching, and I'm, I'm somewhat shocked at the quality of the internet connection that we've managed here, you're currently the other side of the world. Yeah, so I'm right now in Melbourne, in Australia, uh, and I've been here for about a month or two. And um, it's part of a year that I'm spending here to do some research in clinical work. Um, I had a really good opportunity um, from Prostate Cancer UK and the John Black Charitable Foundation to spend some time at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, um, who are an expert centre in particular diagnostic um, clinical trials and therapeutics related to an imaging modality called PSMA PET. And um, I'm developing some studies here, launching some of my own, and also doing some clinical work. Um, so it's a great opportunity for me and my family, and we've all come along here uh, for the year before I come back to the UK. Amazing. I mean, there's so much to dive into. I'm, I'm afraid, just for the sake of the, the bulk of the questions that have been sent in, we're going to have to go right back to the beginning of, of things again, a little bit of an interview as faux pas. But um, most of the questions that, that people have sent in are to do with training. And, and you know, say, say I'm a perhaps a, a third year medical student or a fourth year medical student starting out and I've maybe done a urology placement and I decide that I really like it. How do I go about maybe developing my interest in urology and possibly becoming a urologist? So um, urology is one of those specialties where unless you have a, a placement in it or someone talks to you about it or you have a good mentor, it's quite hard to naturally be interested in it because most of the training and placements for undergraduates is not in urology. Mm. And so um, really, I'll take this as an opportunity to tell you how amazing urology is. And, um, you know, the, the, the thing I liked about it the most was the pathology, the, the fact you have a bit of medicine in it as well as a bit of surgery, uh, the hands-on aspects, the fact that you can train from even when you're quite young to doing procedures where you can gain quite a lot of competence, things like flexible cystoscopies to procedures which are a bit more complicated, things like rigid cystoscopies to um, really quite big operations using things like a robot. And you have all these gadgets which you can use to do these operations with and treat your patients. And a lot of the time you see your patients get really a lot better uh, within a short time frame. And all of those aspects are reasons why you should really try and make an effort to try and get involved in urology. So you know, the way to, to reach out to do something, um, you could do it on a clinical basis or on a research basis. Um, on a research basis, um, the British Urology Researchers and Surgical Training is a research collaborative that I founded um, some time ago, and it welcomes uh, people of all levels, medical students, um, junior doctors, senior doctors, to get involved in projects we're running nationally. And um, we have things on our website, which is www.firsturology.com, um, which give people an opportunity to get involved in projects being run at their local centre, wherever you are in the country, or in fact, world for that matter. Um, in terms of clinical work, what I would suggest is to get in touch with someone from your local unit. Um, either this could be a, a, a research-based person or it can be a clinical-based person. Often the research-based people are good people to be involved with because they can put you in touch with people at the hospital and also give you research opportunities as well. And it's, I think it's just about spending time seeing what the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, life of a urologist is like, seeing the types of patients you see in clinic and what type of pathology, pathologies you encounter and seeing um, some of the things in theatre and seeing if you think that's the kind of area you hope to you see yourself in. And also, I often find the people around you, if you think that you, you're like those people and they're, they're nice people and you want to end up like that, then it's often a good sign as well. That's the right specialty for you. That's sage advice. And it, it's funny, it, it's funny that remark. I often do find that urologists, I mean, surgeons obviously have, have a reputation um, for certain personality types, but urologists 
do tend to be very pleasant, I think, within the surgical specialties, if that's a fair comment. Um, I completely agree with you, Ollie. <laughs> Yeah, certainly my experience, just one of those things that maybe maybe as an aspiring neurosurgeon, the bar isn't very high. <laughs> so I'm just easily <laughs> impressed. Um, so when it comes to the actual training structure, then, so let's say that I'm now, you know, maybe I did my elective in neurology and I found that I really enjoyed it and I got some hands on experience and I enjoyed it and how, what am I going to do next to actually start my training? What's that process? Um, so what I would say is um, try and do foundation, a foundation program training job, uh, which has some neurology in it. And so, you know, things have changed a bit since I did it, but I understand now you rank your jobs. And um, depending on your scores after your, um, your medical school rankings, you can get placed in a certain job. And so I would suggest if you like urology, try and make sure or you want to get exposed to it at least to see if you want to do it later on uh, rank the urology jobs a bit higher up and one of the great things about urology jobs is that um, you see so many pathologies and so many so much turnover that you do get exposed to a wide range of urology uh, whilst you're on that job and um, the other thing you could do is if you're interested in research you could apply for uh, an academic foundation job uh, which has a urology component in and often those will be at dedicated centers that have a strong reputation for research. And again, um, if you contact those people in advance, you can get involved in projects before you even apply. And that's a good way to foster a bit of interest in that subject area. Um, after the foundation program, um, you want to apply for a core surgical training program. And again, that's changed slightly since, uh, since I did it. But now I think typically it depends on which part of the country you're in. Um, in many parts of the country, there are theme jobs. So you can choose a theme job with the urology theme, which allows you to have enough exposure over the two years of course surgical training to, to subsequently apply to become a registrar in urology. Um, or it could be a, a, in an, a, an area like London where it's necessarily themed, but you have the opportunity to still pick your and rank your jobs, but you choose something with urology in it. And after your first year, you can reapply to do particular jobs uh, within the London area. Um, and that's what I ended up doing. So it, it seems that what you're saying or the theme of what's coming through here is that if there is any opportunity to tailor your jobs towards urology, then that's definitely something that you should be doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then just to make things clear, um, again, some, some of the, the medical students that are watching or indeed medical applicants who are thinking about changing careers have maybe fostered a career in neurology um there there are two competitive steps right as you're saying just just for their benefit so there is core surgical training which is one competitive round of applications and then there is applying for your registrar job in neurology correct yeah so the, the part which um i didn't talk about too much which is actually probably you know the hardest part is the st3 job which is when you start to become your registrar a registrar and that's uh, again via uh, a national selection type process and you apply and you interview shortlisted and you interview and um, that decides whether or not you'll become a registrar in neurology and depending on your ranking you'll be placed at a, a deanery around the country. Sure do you think um, I, I'm, I'm sure there there is a degree of, of opinion to this but is urology training fairly variable around the country you know will, will someone at a big fancy London centre receive substantially different training to somebody training more rurally for example yeah I look I think um probably similar to other specialties that so training will vary in its nature and um type of work you see depending on where you go in the country I think in general though um training from ST3 onwards in urology is is generally well liked I think um, good things about urology that uh, always go down well are things like the work-life balance mm. tends to be reasonably good. So you can have uh, an active um, life doing other things as well as your career. So that might be um, other interests uh, outside of medicine. Um, it might be uh, things related to family life. It could be uh, whatever you want, but generally for urology, because the on-calls tend to be a bit, um, a bit not easier, but just a bit 
more friendly with and compatible with doing other things, um, that can really help um, with choosing that as a, a specialty. Perfect. Um, and then something that you talked about at the beginning, which I'd just like to press you on a little bit further now, is you 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 talked about the range of urological presentations and pathologies and that's something you enjoy clearly and it encompasses as you said everything from the kidneys down to the external genitalia um as you continue your training as a registrar and you become more senior what are the options like for subspecializing um options are good and um, this is what i like about urology you know for a long time uh, whilst you're training in your first few registrar years you do what we call core procedures, which are the most common procedures amongst a range of different areas. For example, uh, stones, people who get kidney stones, you can do some work in that area. Um, lower urinary tract symptoms. So people who get an enlarged prostate as they get older and need surgery in that area. And then there's um, a whole load of cancer work in the different organs. And so you can do some basic work in all of those um, areas to start off with. And after your first three years or so, um, you then start to think about what you would like to do in, in a more specialist area. And one of the great things about the UK is that a lot of the subspecialties within urology are quite high volume. So um, a surgeon will become quite good at um, one particular area, but also have a general breadth of knowledge to be able to allow them to treat patients of all conditions uh, with a urological problem. Uh, but that one subspecialist area generally in your last year or two of training is the area that you spend most of your time doing to allow you to become an expert in that area. Sure. Um, so, so what, I mean, do you have a subspecialist area that you practice in? Yeah. So um, my subspecialist area is allied to my research area, which is uh, cancer and um, particularly prostate uh, and bladder cancer. Um, I would say the types of operations I'll be doing um, back in the UK will be prostate related operations. So that's quite a, a specialist type of subspecialization, um, which you don't often see uh, things in the same way in some other countries that you're in. Um, but in the UK, we're, we're quite focused on one or two uh, disease areas, which is, which is good in that you, you really get good at what you're doing. Sure. And something that you have now mentioned multiple times um, and something that is actually on my list to ask you about is is gadgets because certainly when I was in medical school um, in my my local center had a da Vinci um, and the sort of robotic systems I think urology is one of those specialties that has a reputation for having as you say lots of gadgets and cool toys why do you think that's happened with urology more than other specialties um Good question. I mean, I think um, as a specialty, urologists are quite keen to explore new ideas and see if they can offer things that can improve the quality of life of patients. And I think um, by virtue of being trained by people who are quite used to using a range of gadgets and by using those in your training, you're naturally a bit inquisitive as to what's the next thing to try and change and improve practice. And in urology, you'll see uh, over the last 10 years that the way that we do things has completely changed across a range of specialties, subspecialties. So, um, um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's a great, uh, great area for urology and definitely something that I think people should consider. So, you know, the types of things we talk about are um, flexible scopes. When you start off in your training and doing flexible cystoscopies, which are camera tests inside the urinary passage. And those are quite high volume diagnostic procedures, which are really good fun and um, really useful and helpful for the patients. And then you can go to things which happen in theatre under general anaesthetic. So the, the, the rigid cystoscopies with uh, instruments which can either like scrape things away from the bladder or take samples from the bladder or shave away parts of the prostate to make it the opening a bit bigger. And then you've got bigger operations which can be open operations. Um, for example, if you were to remove um, a testicle for cancer or they can have uh, laparoscopic or robotic operations where you make small cuts in the tummy and you put um, a couple of instruments in and you sit at the side of the room and control what we call the robot um, to uh, do the operation under your uh, vision. Um, so, you know, that whole range of things I've mentioned is why it's such an exciting specialty. 
Yeah, well, one of my most vivid memories from medical school, we, we had a, an incredibly enthusiastic, tiny female consultant <laughs> urologist. She was maybe five foot, if that, in high heels. And um, I have a very visit, vivid memory even of a, a la laser, cannot speak in an interview, laser lithotripsy, I think it was, where she was, um, where they were blasting apart kidney stones. <laughs> she was clearly having an enormous amount of fun <laughs> doing that. Um, it's really just stuck with me as an experience. But I've only got one more question to ask you about training that I, I must ask you before we move on, uh, which is to do with run throughs, because I think certainly as people get through medical school and they, they get into clinical practice, the idea of run through training pathways with fewer competitive steps become more appealing. Um, do run through pathways exist in urology? Um, so look, good question. So I think there are uh, two aspects to this. Uh, one is the academic pathway, which technically can be a run through type pathway, uh, depending on which part of the country you're in. Um, however, I think the there is there was a new scheme which I think has been introduced recently, though I don't know the status of it right now, which is called the IST. Mm. And I'm not sure if that is a way by which someone could run through um, from the start to the end without going through too many selection processes. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have enough knowledge on, on the changes recently to answer that aspect. But for the academic aspect, you know, and th there is a great opportunity to have a, a run through type job. And um, at those points at which you would normally interview for, say, an ST3 job, and if your if your academic uh, job is a bit earlier than that, you can still run through and you just have to have a, a regular interview at ST3 and typically you just have to pass the interview rather than be, being really good. But for your obviously to get the academic job in the first place, that's a competitive application process where these days you've got to be pretty good to get it. And um, so I would say look out for the um, ST1 applications for academic clinical fellows, which are typically run through jobs. Um, otherwise, um, have a look out on the uh, IST, um, which may or may not continue. I've, I've heard different things. So I think they were trialing it to see how well it worked. And I'm not sure whether they're going to continue it. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's just for nice. regular. Uh, that's for regular training. So uh, non-academic. Yeah, um, I, I believe that most of the schemes have been paused at the moment, as you say. Certainly, I remember for orthopedics and things like that, they were trialing them and general surgery, but equally, I've not heard much about them um, recently. Amazing. Well, I need to impress upon the viewers now, um, Vera, I think this is, this is the time I'm going to take my opportunity to strike on this, which is that we have a researcher of quite some magnitude sat in front of us today. And we were having a conversation before I started recording about changing practice. You, you are an academic interested in, in how your work changes practice. And I'm going to share a very short anecdote that I know my father won't mind me sharing, but it's important to this talk. And I, I emailed you about this, which is prostate biopsy. Um, my father recently had a scare for prostate cancer as lot, you know, lots of men uh, in advancing age do. Um, I understand in, in the country and I'm sure indeed around the world. And when he had this, this scare, a mildly raised PSA result, he was given a, um, a rectal exam and a prostate MRI rather than a very painful prostate biopsy. And I would, I would like to invite you to tell, <laughs> to tell me and the viewers exactly why. Yeah. So, um, Look, I, I, I hope your dad's OK. Um, that's the first thing. But, um, you know, uh, millions of men around the world are diagnosed every year with prostate cancer. And my interest uh, for my research is diagnosing cancer better, avoiding um, harm from side effects or things like a biopsy and over treatment from unnecessary treatment based on um, a prostate biopsy, which was traditionally called a truss biopsy. So um, my research focused on introducing MRI um, upfront in men with suspected cancer who are being investigated. And if the result of the MRI was all clear, so it's negative, they don't need a biopsy because the MRI was quite good. If the result of the MRI was suspicious, they go on to have a, a targeted biopsy just to those areas where you can see where the cancer might be. And that way we can improve um, how much cancer 
we find. And it also allows people who don't have significant cancer to, to avoid a biopsy. And that research was something I did during my PhD. And um, it was a trial called the Precision Trial, which um, our group published in the New England Journal of Medicine and has led to changes in practice for how we diagnose men uh, with prostate cancer around the world. So um, really it's been a lot of hard work from uh, the, the team, um, people who are my mentors who came before me um, and lots of the uh, patients who wanted to take part in the study. So, you know, it's thanks to all of them that we were able to produce this work that could change practice and allow people like your dad to benefit from the results. And, you know, that kind of aspect of being able to change practice and see a benefit um, is what really attracts me to academia in urology. And that's why I um, am an academic urologist rather than a full-time clinical urologist. I was having a look at all the relevant dates of this, Viru, the other night and calculating when you left medical school and when you must have started your training and all the rest of it, trying to do some maths. And as you say, that trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I think is the highest impact factor journal in the world, I, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's a pretty good journal. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's if you want to get some journal. research that changes practice, uh, it's a good journal to publish in. Yeah, Sure, but you, you had that paper published at what was relatively quite a junior stage in your career. Yeah, I mean, it's fair to say that um, having a paper published in the New England Journal is, you know, like a lifetime ambition for any researcher. Um, many researchers won't achieve that. Um, it's not an easy feat. Even if you're, you know, an outstanding researcher, you might not achieve that. So, you know, a combination of many things, particularly great mentors, uh, being at the right time in the right place, obviously working hard, um, all those things coming together with an integrated academic clinical program. Uh, and things kind of fell into place. And sometimes you need a bit of luck and um, a persistence and determination and uh, things eventually come good. How does it feel? You've not only had your, your New England Journal, which as you say is, is something that the average professor might never achieve. Um, and not only that, but that, that trial has rewritten clinical guidelines. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the second half is something that that feeling you can never quite put into words um, because, you know, when you see practice change and the potential benefit for so many like millions of men every year around the world, um, that that you cannot you cannot recreate that feeling and um, or describe quite what it means. And it, it changes every day as you see things change around you as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, that's the most important thing. That's the reason why we do this. So sometimes you can get a, an amazing paper published in, in not the top journal but it means a lot and changes practice as well I thought I'd put that out there as well so what's next where can you I mean obviously you, you said you're out you're out in Melbourne doing your research now but where do you go from here yeah so um, when I finished over here I'll come back to the UK and um, continue in my job um, as an academic urologist um, spending half my time doing research and half doing clinical practice and uh, as an academic, you want to progress to be a chair of your department or university. Um, and as a clinician, you want to try and be the best you can in the, in the specialty that you're in, in the procedures that you're doing. So those are, those are the two goals um, with the overriding aim of benefiting as many patients as I can. What a glorious answer. Um, I, I do just have a couple more questions about the nature of urology it itself before we um, before we start to draw to a close here. I mean, that's what's in your immediate future. What what do you think is the future direction of urology as a specialty? Because there's a bit of a across all specialties at the moment. There's a bit of a training crisis. Um, I think it's fair to say in terms of recruitment and nobody can get case numbers and things like that. What's the direction of urology? Um, good question. So uh, from a benign standpoint, um, a lot of the work we do, for example, in areas like benign prostatic hyperplasia with men with low urinary tract symptoms, um, that kind of area will probably get bigger and bigger because we have an aging population. And as people get older, they're more likely to have those problems. Um, so in terms of how we're going to deal with that, 
Um, the traditional operation where we manage that problem is, is what's called a TURP, a transurethral resection of the prostate. And that's where you put a heated loop uh, via a rigid camera into the urinary passage and shave away the big prostate, if you like. Um, now, lots of new technologies are coming out. So technologies which you can be done as a day case procedure, where you uh, just fold the loads of the prostate back, um, procedures where you use a laser to shave away the prostate, um, and other medications that are coming out which really prevent people needing an operation in the first place. Um, so there's so many areas that are being developed in that aspect to help patients get better. I think we have the tool to address that situation. Um, from a cancer point of view, um, the real thing that's changed over the last 10 years to kind of address some of the issues that we've had are, is, is centralization of work. And in the UK, we're really good at doing that. So uh, people who need, for example, prostate cancer operations will typically come from five or six different centers to a central center where they do uh, the operation in high volume. And I think um, with things like centralization and using the, the latest gadgets at those places which have the high volume, that will enable us to overcome some of the uh, challenges that you suggested earlier. Um, I think in urology, um, research is always, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries of what we do. And a lot of medications are coming out which can really address certain stages of disease, which traditionally we have treated in quite different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think survival outcomes are going to improve a lot for patients with urological cancer. So I'm quite excited about that. Um, I think there's probably a, a brief summary of uh, where I think urology is going. Sure. And, and perhaps a more pragmatic question, but, but certainly as, as a young trainee, um, if you like, it's, it's certainly on my mind. How's the job security? I think right now it's good. Um, <laughs> my understanding is, is that there's quite a big shortage of urologists. So uh, for people finishing their training, um, from what I gather, it's not necessarily as hard as it used to be to get a job. Um, I don't know if that's strictly true because, um, you know, it, it, you kind of want to ha have to get a job where you want to get a job. Uh, but I think it's probably now as good as it's been since, um, you know, for the last decade. So uh, I would say in urology, it's a great specialty to go into. Uh, there's lots of opportunity for jobs and um, developing a subspecialty area, um, using things that are going to change and update and um, let you use some latest technology and apply your research to your clinical practice. What a great specialty. <laughs> well, would you do it all again? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, 100 percent. Easy. Well, that is where we will slowly move towards a close. Do you have any final golden sage pieces of advice for any young aspiring neurologists out there? Yeah, I'd say, look, don't be shy. Um, the only way to make yourself stand out is to get in contact with someone, um, offer yourself to do some research, show that you're interested. And as you do that, even if you start off with something small, uh, you'll get bigger and bigger opportunities. And uh, before you know it, you'll be presenting an important piece of work at a big conference and changing practice. Plus or minus a New England paper. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you ever so much, Dr. Viri Kassibis for Nathan. Thank you for, for coming on from the other side of the world. No problem. Thanks for having me, Ollie. No problem. Well, keep well and carry on changing practice. I'm sure that there's many men around the world who will continue to thank you for what you're doing. <laughs>